I'm Mark, and this is the Mr. Productivity Podcast, the podcast to help solopreneurs banish overwhelm, reduce stress, and get more done. In today's episode, I'm going to be talking with Francis Wade. He is the author of Perfect Time-Based Productivity and the host of the Task Management and Time Blocking Summit and Podcast. Before we dive into today's show, I want to invite you to my next monthly masterclass, which is coming up this Friday, March 3rd, and learn how to create habits that will serve you, what to avoid when creating habits, the three routines you need to have and how to create them, plus five habits that will change your life. To register, head on over to mrproductivity.com forward slash masterclass. Remember, Mr. is all spelled out, M-I-S-T-E-R, mrproductivity.com forward slash masterclass, or click the link in the show notes. Francis, welcome to the show. Thanks, Mark. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's uh, the reason why you're here. We're going to explain more about it at the end of the episode, but you got something really exciting coming up in about a week. And uh, I just want to tease the audience so they stick around to the end. So they figure out, ooh, what is this exciting thing? Well, you're going to have to listen to the whole conversation with Francis. And the reason why I had Francis on the show is because he's like me. He loves talking about productivity. And if you've been listening to the show for a while, you've heard me yap on this stuff for a while. So I thought I'd invite Francis on to have a fresh perspective on productivity. So I'm going to give you the courtesy, Francis. Where would you like to jump off in our conversation today? Well, we're talking about solopreneurs. That's 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 our target audience. And um, I'm a solopreneur, and I've been I've been one since 1993. And I, I don't know if what your audience might be like, but if they're solopreneurs like I am, then they we care a lot about our productivity. We do not like wasting time. We remember what it was like to work for a company if we did. And I, I worked for AT and T for five years, and I remember sitting in meetings thinking my life was wasting away because it was, they were so unproductive. So we love productivity because productivity for us means results. That is so powerful. And here's what I want. I really want to hone in on the solopreneurs who work from home, because when you work from home, you have certain challenges, shall we say, that people in the corporate environment don't have. In other words, you've got the laundry, the dishwasher, the dog, the neighbor, and all these things you have to fight against. Now, Here's my approach. I want to know how you approach this, Francis. So mm-hmm. I I understand that these things are going to happen. You're going to get tempted to do the dishwasher or throw a load in the laundry in the washing machine or go talk to the neighbor. And I say, first of all, it's okay unless you do it all day. Number two, I encourage people to schedule it because you're probably going to do these things anyways. If you say, okay. I'm going to schedule a half an hour at two o'clock this afternoon when I take my break to go do some household chores. That way, when you get tempted at 10 a.m., you can go, oh, wait a minute. That's on my schedule for later. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you will be tempted because the nature of, I think, solopreneurs is that we're bright. We have lots of ideas. We have lots of energy. And we're always interrupting ourselves to do one thing, give up one thing and start another. So your mind is always kind of racing ahead and thinking about what it should be doing and what it could be doing. And why am I not doing that? Especially if we're under a little bit of stress, you know, it's it's even worse then, right? (laughs) Yeah. As a matter of fact, I I, reason why I laugh is because I listened to an audio book by Chris Bailey and it's all about the power of meditation and productivity. Now you mentioned solopreneurs. We like to go, 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 go. And for me to sit down for five minutes and just be still and not think about anything, that is so challenging for me because all these thoughts are going through my head. And when I take time to be quiet, the thoughts go, ooh, he's quiet. Let's bombard him with even more thoughts. And But I tell you, I've been doing it, I think, for like four weeks now. And I can tell you when I take the time, even just five minutes, just to do and think about nothing and just lay there and focus on your breath for like five minutes, it actually increases my productivity. Yeah, I I, I recommend I picked up meditation some time ago. I I don't regularly meditate, but I benefited greatly from the practice because you're able to do exactly what you said. You kind of learn how to center and you learn how to sort of allow the thoughts to go by without engaging them. And it's the engaging, oh boy, that's, it's the engaging, especially the fearful ones. 
Yeah, what I've learned to do is when a thought comes in, I actually say in my head, breathing in, breathing out. If I focus on saying the words in my head, breathing in, breathing out, it's easier for me to push those thoughts away. But if I don't do that, I, it, it, I'm not going to win that battle. It's just not going to happen because all these thoughts, if you have a, a solopreneur mind or entrepreneur mind, these thoughts are ever present in your mind. And you've got to, you've got to take time just to be quiet, to not do or think about anything. If you truly want to be your most productive self. You're absolutely right. I would say that I've been through a number of sort of practices like the one you mentioned that you're using now, um, the, the, the one I came up with in response to a, a letter from the tax department <laughs> it started about <laughs> three, you know, one of those, one of those <laughs> started about three months ago. And I came up with a practice in which I say, what am I, what do I have? And am I wanting what I have? If I'm not wanting what I have, what can I want instead? So mm-hmm. I came up with this thing and, and, you know, guess what? You know, it kind of works, <laughs> you know, <laughs> until it stops working. It's working. <laughs> nice. Nice. So let's go back to what we were talking about before I, I turned uh, and pivoted about meditation. When you get tempted, because you work from home as I do, when you right. get tempted, you go out to the kitchen to get something to drink or you go get an apple or something like that. And you you say, oh, you know, we ran the dishwasher last night. I got to empty it. Or, you know what? I should throw a load of laundry in the wash machine how do you handle those? Because that that's a real thing for solopreneurs who work from home. Right. right. And the worst thing, the worst thing to happen is to get to the end of the day and realize that I was busy all day and I did nothing. Mm. You know, I, 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 I interrupted myself over and over and over again. And I half finished, half completed a whole bunch of stuff and I'm really tired, but I can't point to a single thing that I accomplished. And I think all solopreneurs have that kind of day at some point. And then most of us kind of sit back and say, well, well, how come? You know, why, why am I doing it this way? And that gets us into the world of task management, which is my area of specialty. And the, the best practice that exists, it's been around for, for ages since Ben Franklin, is to time block the day, is to spend the first part of the day or maybe the prior evening creating a schedule for yourself and then following it. It, it, it starts with that simple practice, which... I don't think half of the entrepreneur or solopreneurs out there are actually doing it. Oh, I, I agree with you 100%. And I always tell people, tell your time where to go instead of wondering where it went. But mm-hmm. I don't want people mm-hmm. ever to schedule every minute of every day. You need to allow your time to be able to contract and expand because that call, it's going to start late. The right. call is going to run late. Uh, the guy who's supposed to be there and that, you know, know, that infamous two hour window, he's going to show up late. So if you pack your schedule so tight, there's no breathing room and something goes wrong. Well, now your schedule's shot for the rest of the day. So I encourage people plan your day, but make sure you put these blocks where right. maybe personal development or reading right. or exercising things that you can move around. You got to allow your schedule right. to be flexible because if it's not, it could be for a, a situation where you're very overwhelmed. Right, 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 right. And, and, you know, even screw up time, you could put a half an hour every day for screw ups. Yeah. You don't, you don't know when you're going to consume it. But you know you will. <laughs> so yeah. You might well, same with same with social media. I mean, you're going exactly. to be on social media. So why don't you just go ahead and schedule that social media for 30 minutes? That way, when you're tempted at 930 in the morning and you should be working on your manuscript or a blog post or whatever, and you you see that that iPhone and you're like, oh, TikTok's calling my name or LinkedIn's calling my name. You can say, oh, no. That's scheduled for two o'clock this afternoon or during lunch. So don't fight it. Don't say, oh, I don't ever go on social media because you're going to be tempted. You're going to give in to the temptation. So I say schedule it. And that way your brain knows, okay, I'm going to get my dopamine hit on TikTok at three o'clock this afternoon. No, no. I, I imagine that your, your audience is probably made up of two kinds of people. There are some who already do something like time blocking. And there are those who haven't heard of it before. So we just addressed the ones who hadn't heard of it. But for those who actually do it, there is another trap that, that I'm really interested in, in and I'm working on and, and sharing with people, which is that if you follow the words of someone like, or follow my words or your words, 
and say, well, you know, this very smart person told me to do it this way. And you do it the way they do it, that that only takes you so far. And we solopreneurs, you know, we don't have time to be messing around with trying to find all kinds of different solutions. We find one person who tells us what we should do and we do it because we're pretty good at, you know, we just dial it in and then we follow it, right? And we follow it and we do it and we we put it into play. But then point comes when it no longer works as it should. And that's what happened to me when I moved to Jamaica. If you want me, you want me to share that story because that'll, that'll take a few minutes. <laughs> yeah, please do. I, I think it's interesting because I think when you move, it sounds good on paper. It sounds good on your mind. Oh, but when you does. actually move, totally different animal. I know. I know. Most, most, most folks who've never lived in Jamaica, and I tell them I'm going to live here, they say, oh, my God, that's awesome. <laughs> You go to the beach all the time. You smoking. Oh yeah, that's what you do all the time, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. That's you know they're 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 they they think it's an extended vacation, <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> and and I had my visions of it because just to explain, people you know people hear my accent and say, oh, where were you born? Well, the truth is, I was born in Cape Cod. I was born in in Falmouth up, up there in the Massachusetts. And my parents moved back to Jamaica, and I did my schooling here, my high schooling, high school and primary schooling. And then I went back to the States and lived for 20 years, stayed on after college, and then once again came back to Jamaica, this time as an adult, and this time expecting to do great things. I really wanted to make a difference here, which is why I, I came back. I really wanted to make a contribution and thought I could do that with some of the time management things I had learned because I was a, a teacher of time management programs in the U.S., Came back and all of a sudden I was wickedly unproductive. It was not what I expected, exactly what you said. It was way more hectic and way more unpredictable than I imagined. And I struggled. And, you know, this is what happens when something big in your life changes, like you have twins, for example, or you, <laughs> or you get promoted to, you know, a new job in a new district and you got to move and the family and it's a new responsibility. And whenever there's one of these big changes, all of a sudden there's all these new things that you need to do. And there's this period that we go through when, when we struggle. And there, there's no book. And I went looking for these books, by the way. I, I looked for a book called, What Do You Do When You Move to a Developing Country? And How Do You Stay Productive? <laughs> I did not find one. <laughs> that sounds like a book you should write, sir. Well, I kind of did. I did. Oh. So my, 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 I've written a couple of books. And they were kind of the answer to how do you, when you can't follow a guru's advice any longer because there's no guru. There was no guru writing about the topics I needed them to write about. What do you do? And that got me thinking and developing and saying, okay, when you get to the point where you realize that there's no one size fits all solution to your productivity in terms of your task management, what do you do? So I wrote the two books to answer that question. So that's kind of my life's work in, in one sense. You know, what's interesting is I have read a lot about why people write books, whether it's a Tim Ferriss or a Cal right. Newport, they write books not to sell books. They write books because they are fascinated in a topic and they research it and they go, well, I did all this research to teach myself. Let me teach other people. That's how it happens. And I'm not talking about fiction books. I'm talking about personal development books. And that's what you did. You that's exactly what I did. <laughs> You didn't have an idea, say, I want to sell these books. You're like, let me learn. I'm like, well, I've already done the research. Let me just write a book. Yeah, I actually developed a program, a training. That, wow. that came first and got some people to do it and did that for about six, uh, about four or five years. And then I wrote my first book because I, it was the thing was working, which was the good news. The, the course was working. People liked it. They were getting results. And I said, I got to put this in a format that people could actually start to use it for themselves. And that's what got me writing. I, I wanted to encapsulate a whole bunch of blog posts and a lot of ideas into one kind of portable format that folks could benefit from. So it's, it's exactly what you said. I know I didn't get rich from it. No, that, that didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to go back on something you mentioned really in passing, and I want to make sure we camp out on it for a few minutes. You use the word gurus. Now, I... I believe the most productive people have coaches. Coaches have coaches. But to your point, they're not every, not every coach is created equal and you will outgrow a coach. So I've had coaches and I outgrew them. And that's why there is a multiplicity of coaches out there. So don't think that you're hurting the feelings of the coach or the guru, or whatever you want to call them. 
you're going to be in a different point of your life. So in 2020 and 2021, 2022, 2023, and so on, you are going to change where you're at, where you are on your journey. And you may get to a point where your current coach can't take you any further for whatever reason. So right. I, I want you to listen to what Francis is saying and understand, listener, that one coach doesn't have every single one of the answers. And so you need to figure out, okay, I want to learn X. Who's the best coach I can hire or the best book I can read that teach me X? So don't hook your star to one coach because no coach in this world can teach you everything. Right. So there's, there, there's an interesting model that I, I sort of stumbled across when I was doing this. And it, it draws a lot from the sporting world. But if you look at a Roger Federer or a Serena Williams or Rafael Nadal, Nadal, the top tennis players, they go through coaches. So they're, to, they're at the point where they're actually coaching themselves using the input of others. They're self-coaching. If you listen to them talk, they're the ones who are deciding what to do. And it's because they're at the top of the profession. There's no one playing better than they are, and they've been managing their playing at this level for decades. So they'll have a coach, but the coach is not the end-all and be-all, like you said. But back when they were started, so I watched Serena Williams' movie the other day, and her father, you know, he told her exactly what to do. Because when you're at the beginning of a journey, of a skill that you want to develop, you need someone to tell you exactly what to do. It's very prescriptive in the beginning. But then as you make progress and as you become more skilled, you actually end up being the one who coaches yourself. So it turns out, you know, in, in tennis and let's say football, for example, there are a lot of awesome coaches. So you can get coached for many, many, many years and never even reach your potential. Are you one of the million Join over 1 million people, which may be a slight hyperbole, and get productivity tips that will help you live a more productive life. Head on over to mrproductivity.com forward slash insider. Because it's a well-developed field. Like, for example, you know, the, you probably have heard of the NFL Combine. Yes. So, you know, for those who aren't familiar with it, college football players go to the Combine when they're ready to be drafted. And the combine is a place where two things happen. One is that they get detailed feedback, extremely detailed feedback on every aspect of their game. And they break it down into these exercises that they do. And they say, okay, your throwing is 5.7 out of 10. Your running is... And they give them this detailed scorecard. But they also give that scorecard to the recruiters. And the recruiters determine based on what they're reading, you know, um, does this person need development in an area that we can support them? Could they fit into our program? It's extremely sophisticated. However, in task management, there is not that level of sophistication. <laughs> in other words, there's a few gurus, a few books that that make sense. But once you get through kind of the basics, you're now coaching yourself way faster than you would if you were in the NFL. And that's just the nature of, you know, a lot of resources have gone into football and tennis, a lot of expertise. Yes. The same yes. level of investment has not been made in task management and in time management. So you end up coaching yourself a lot earlier. So you come up, up upon this kind of question. Hmm. If the one size fits all guru isn't out there for me and there's, there's not one person to get all of my answers from, what do I do now? And the funny thing is you're in the same boat as Roger Federer or or any you know top top quarterback you're in the same boat as that, that that as they are because they're asking themselves hmm you know my last coach she was good in some ways but you know I, he didn't know everything i kind of had to modify they're going through the same question as well so it's a it's a question that hits you when the coaches aren't available and you now need to coach yourself so the choice of if you if you do decide to find a coach you've got to use someone who it's going to help you in your self-coaching rather than someone who thinks they're going to give you prescriptions. Am I, am I making sense? Yeah, you are. And one of the things I learned from Grant Cardone a couple of years ago is you always want to follow someone who is where you, who is at where you want to be. Don't go to someone who read a book, then wrote a book on how to succeed. You want to find someone 
who is where you want to be at some time. And, right. you know, you mentioned the NFL combine and I, th- I started laughing because it's not always accurate because there's a guy that went to the combine. They said he'd never make a good NFL quarterback. His name's Tom Brady. Well, <laughs> Tom Brady. The, the, the combine doesn't always get it right, but right. you make a very good point. Now I remember my very first coach I ever invested with was a Tony Robbins result coach. And I remember saying to my coach, I can't wait till I get the level of Tony Robbins where I don't need a coach. And I remember what they said to me. They said, do you know why Tony Robbins is at the level he is at? I'm like, no, he goes, cause he has coaches. I'm like coaches. He goes, yes, Tony has coaches. If you want to learn about nutrition or video or presentation skills, that's why these people are at the top level. Now you may not find to your point, a coach said exactly what you want to learn, but I believe you can learn from every speaker, every right. educational YouTube video, every book. Right. If you go in there and say, well, you know, they're not exactly what I'm looking for, but can you learn something from them? And I believe right. if your opportunity antennas are up, you can learn from everybody. Oh yeah. Well, you see what you just said, that's, that's one of the big things that, that, we're teaching in, I write in my book that we're doing in our webinars that we do in the work that we do is to teach people how to approach experts again with different areas, using your own filter, discerning the value in what they're saying, extracting that value. Because if it, it's not that they're not valuable, it's that they're not, you can't use them as a prescription. So now you're drawing from like 10 coaches, five coaches four books, three academic papers, 10 webinars, five conferences, and you're, you're, you're sort of looking for the, the nuggets, the, mm-hmm. the, the key insights that you can apply. So no, it's, it's more, there's more discernment on your part. So yes. you're not looking to pick up a guru and to join a cult. No, <laughs> those days should be behind you. The, the idea is what's the, what's the real power in what this person is saying and how are they, how are they getting at it? Tony Robbins, I've heard, you know, I've, I've also, I've also heard turn, Tony speak live and he talks about asking yourself questions and the quality of your questions, as he says, or used to say, determines the quality of your life, right? Yep. Ask yourself great, great questions. When a coach comes along, when you get to that particular level in task management and time management, where you can't follow a guru's prescriptions, you've got to ask different questions to get at the gold. And then apply it to yourself. And same applies to hiring a coach. There's not going to be a coach that you can hire after a particular level that is going to give you a prescription. A good coach will say, well, you're above that level. What you need to do is to take from what I'm saying and what I'm doing and make it your own. So that's a much, it's a much more sophisticated application of good advice. Yeah, I think it gets back. It really becomes granular because when mm-hmm. you get to be at a big level like Tony Robbins, now he's mm-hmm. not going to get an overall guru. He may say, okay, listen, I want to know how to get better at doing this one specific thing. And you go mm-hmm. out and fire, hire a coach that teaches you that very specific thing. See, when you're starting, Mm -hmm. you try to get a coach that can tell you how to be good at a whole bunch of things. But the higher you go up, you still need to have a coach. But now you're going to say, okay, I want to learn this very specific skill. Who Mm -hmm. can teach me this very specific skill? I will learn that skill and plug it in to my knowledge. And I Mm -hmm. think that's where you're getting at. It's not like you're not ever going to have a coach again. Now you're going to be getting very specific on what skills you want to develop. Am I understanding you correctly? Right, right. It's it's actually happening. It's it's happened in my life. I I don't coach people directly on their productivity. Instead, I, I train trainers. Mm. So it's a, it's a, it's a one step removed, right? I'm coaching the coach and that's a whole different ball game. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a whole, it's not for them personally at that point. It's for them to multiply the impact that they're having on other people in terms of their productivity and their task management. So it's a very, it's a very different approach than, put, than coaching someone um, directly, but you're, it's exactly what you're seeing. And, you know, Tony, Tony probably, you know, when someone wants to say, Someone wants to coach him on, here's the hedge funds you should invest in. He probably is like, okay, let me really listen because that's not his area of primary expertise. But when someone says, the way that you're delivering your programs from the stage, Tony, I can coach you in that. So he brings 
30, 40, 50 years of experience to that. Mm -hmm. He brings more experience probably than the person who makes the statement. But maybe he listens to the person and says, well, tell me what you got. Let me, let me see. And he's listening now with all of that experience to say, okay, is there a value? Where is this coming from? So he's listening with these discerning questions in productivity. That's the same thing you're doing. You're listening with these discerning questions if you already have some expertise in the area. I agree. And one of the things I tell people, the biggest productivity tips is something that most people don't like to think about. And we've already talked about sports a lot on the show today is whenever the, the season starts, they go back to training camp. And it doesn't matter if you're Tom Brady, and you've been playing since Jesus walked the earth, you still have to go to training camp and you practice throwing balls. And mm -hmm. the running backs practice running routes. And so do the mm -hmm. receivers. And the punters go back to the basics. I think so many people and tell me if you agree with me, Francis, they want to know the advanced productivity strategies. I'm like, you got to build a solid foundation. You have to keep going back to the basics. What do you think about that? Right, right. No, unfortunately, and this is this is why the an NFL combine is 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 so useful. So, and having a, a a beginning of a season is so useful. Is that if someone can tell you where you're weak and strong in the basics and in the fundamentals, awesome. But most coaches in the productivity world don't have a systematic way of doing that. But it happens to be the topic of my, my second book, which is a self-evaluation format in 13 areas where you come away with a scorecard, kind of like what the one you get from the, the NFL. <laughs> but the, the idea is you're, you're, you're learning to self-assess your skills. Most people can't afford a coach. And that's just the truth. And they can't afford a productivity coach. That's because they're, they're, A, they're hard to find and they're, they're kind of expensive. And if you're a solely entrepreneur, you're the one who's going to be coaching yourself 99% of the time in the area of productivity. So what you can do is develop your ability to analyze and diagnose your behaviors. It's not hard, but it is different. <laughs> you know, it is kind of like when I, if you're going to coach yourself throwing a ball, when I throw the ball, what happens? And when I throw it this distance, what happens? And when I try to hit that particular target, what happens? If you're going to coach yourself in doing that, you'd have to throw it a few times, diagnose what you're seeing, um, measure the results, and try to apply your own insights to your behavior. It's a, that's the challenge that most solopreneurs have. Where does my behavior need to shift? And what are the, what are the results I'm getting or not getting that indicate that I need to shift. That's the dilemma most solopreneurs have. Now, I want to get a direct message to the solopreneurs because a lot of people will say things, I'll hear them say things like, well, I can't afford it. Well, yeah. Tony Robbins says it very well. It's a question of resources and resourcefulness. If you want to get to that next level, what are you willing to sacrifice? Because some people say, well, I can't afford you, Mark. I'm like, okay, well, let's talk about that for a second. Do you have Hulu, Netflix? Do you have Amazon Prime? Do you go to Starbucks? Do you go out to eat? They're like, what's that got to do with anything? You are prioritizing these other things instead of getting a coach, whether it's me or Francis or somebody else. That's where that's where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. So right. if you truly want to get to the next level, take a look at your life and say, okay, where can I cut back temporarily so I can invest in this other thing so I can learn a skill so I can go back to the life I want. Right now, I think so many people are living the life they want to live, but they can't afford it. So right. instead of sacrificing and hiring a coach or going to a seminar or a conference and learning a skill, they're, they they got it reversed. You agree right. with that? Oh, yeah. I had a I, I worked with one coach for 10 years. And I'll tell you, 10 years, is a, she was exceptional. She was extraordinary in the sense that she would just come and hear my voice and she could tell, she could tell what was going on. <laughs> After 10 years, it's kind of a long time, right? You kind of, she kind of knew what to say at that point. But, but she took me on a path that in retrospect, I can't imagine anyone else could have taken me on. And she wasn't, she was prescriptive a little bit in the beginning, but that quickly gave way to, to, to being, um, more suggestive and, and making recommendations. And we had a similar conversation in the beginning, but I was like, oh man, I can't afford this. this is too expensive. And and the investment I made in that 10 year period made me a different person. I, I can only tell you it took me through it took me here back here to the Caribbean from I was living in New Jersey when I started. It took me from from a marriage into a new marriage, 
that's awesome now. It, it allowed me to change, change, change professions, change the emphasis on what I was working on at the time. There was no time management back then when I started. Now it's a huge part of what I do. There was no strategic planning. That's a huge part of what I do for clients. I didn't do any of it back then. And that all happened in that 10 year period. And boy, you know, my life, that investment that I made, I, 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 it's hard to convince someone that, that, that an, an outsider could make that kind of difference if you'd never had a coach. But uh, coaching, what can I tell you? <laughs> I, well, speaking of investments, one of the things you have coming up really soon, the reason why it, this, this is why this episode came out today when it is, because coming up like this weekend, I believe, or next weekend, next you'll weekend, tell us yeah. what the details are. You've got something really exciting coming up. So what is that? Sure. We have the Task Management and Time Blocking Virtual Summit. So to solve this problem of if one size doesn't fit all, know what in terms of your personal productivity, I went looking, Mark, for experts who could speak to this topic. And this is our fourth summit, but this is the first one focused on this theme. I went looking all over the world to find out who who could speak and who could help people make that jump from I know one size doesn't fit all, but now I need to kind of coach myself. At how do I do that? What are the techniques and the insights that experts use that they don't bother to tell anyone because well, it's a whole longer, longer discussion about where profit comes from if you're selling advice. It's much easier to sell simple advice mm-hmm. than complex advice. So we're going to spend three days next week, uh, March 2nd, 3rd, and 4th, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, looking at this topic of being productive in task management and time blocking beyond the simple prescriptions. And the good news is that the investment, if you only want to come to the three days, is free. Wow. So no excuse that I can't afford it. Nope. No, you do have to invest the time. And I'm here to tell you that this is not, this is going to be the only, probably going to be the only set of experts getting together to talk about this topic for at least a year. This is unique. Now, I want people to understand something. This episode came out today, February 27th, 2023. This Time Blocking Summit is coming up this week. See, I, I try to have my guests on so we can, so you don't think about, oh, let me think about it. No, I, I want you to take action. So you can go to timeblockingsummit.info, timeblockingsummit.info, and sign up. Don't just go, yeah, that would be really nice. I bet I could learn a lot, blah, blah, blah. No, I want you to go to timeblockingsummit.info, and I want you to sign up, like right now, okay? While you're listening to this, open up the browser and go to there and sign up because what Francis is giving you, I've seen the speakers. I was almost going to be a speaker, but I'm too busy. I couldn't do it this year. Maybe in 24, I'll do it. There, There's no reason for you, unless maybe you get abducted by aliens or something like that, or you're the <laughs> richest man in the world. You're helping Elon Musk build Twitter. You should be here. And, and I just want to tell you, you know, I've made, I've created a friendship with Francis. We've you know, talked over the last couple of weeks on LinkedIn. So please go to time blocking summit.info sign up. It's free of cost. It's going to take your time, but are you sick and tired listener? Are you sick and tired of being sick and tired of where you are day after day, quarter after quarter, year after year, or is this the time you finally make a decision? Awesome. What do you think about that? Did I pitch it okay for you? Oh, yeah. I promise. I promise I'm a very warm welcome. A great community of people (laughs) who are lots of solopreneurs, actually. You know, a lot of us get to this point. Yeah. My friend uh, Dave Buck will be presenting. So I, I know several of the people on the on the um, the panel there, and I, I wish you an incredible success on this sum, uh, summit. And I don't know how it's going because you and I are connected on LinkedIn and stuff like that. So I know you'll let me know how it's going. Uh, That's any smart. final pieces of advice for yeah. the solopreneurs listening today that you want to leave them with? Because I find the last piece of advice we leave with people on the podcast is when people, that seems to stick with them. So what is your final piece of advice for them? I'll go back to what you said about the the difference that a coach makes. A a coach who helps you to discover for yourself is worth their weight in gold. An investment in someone who, whether it's financial or your health or your business, or I'm, I'm getting some awesome coaching from some marketing experts 
my lord my god I'm, I'm in the last few it's about three months my marketing has completely been redefined wow. based on what i'm learning from from these guys and as a solopreneur you may not afford to be able to hire all of these experts and bring them all into your life but they are willing to share their message and once they are you've got to be discerning and say okay let me learn how to learn as a solopreneur because it's not the same as learning as an employee as i think we all know oh yeah there's no doubt on that whatsoever and i and i believe If you don't make it a priority to learn something seven days a week, including weekends, vacations, and holidays, read a book, watch a video, listen to a podcast. If you truly want to succeed, whether you're a solopreneur, entrepreneur, you're one of the richest people in the world, because I know Elon Musk, he says he's always learning. You've got to learn something every single day. That's how the successful people keep getting successful. Francis, thank you so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate everything you shared with us. You're welcome. Pleasure. And before we wrap up today, I would like to ask you a huge favor. If you receive value from this interview with Francis today, would you do me a huge favor and Francis a ginormous favor and smash that share button on whatever podcast player you're listening to this on and share this with a few of your friends. If you got value from the episode, they will too. So share this episode. We would greatly appreciate it. And if you want to know more about me, if you want to become a free Mr. Productivity Insider, which is my email newsletter, if you want to find out about my coaching, you want to find out about my history, everything you want to know about me and more can be found at my website, mrproductivity.com, M-I-S-T-E-R, mrproductivity.com. Thank you so much for your time and attention for listening to this episode of the Mr. Productivity Podcast. We'll be back real soon with a brand new episode. Until then, stay productive and stay positive.